e-privacy regulation means for the future of digital marketing, hosted by Data Guidance and Phil Fisher. My name is Christina Olesi, European Privacy Analyst here at Data Guidance. Although there is still much to do in terms of ongoing compliance with the GDPR, the proposed e-privacy regulation now represents the most comprehensive and awaited reform to data protection law in the EU. The ambition timeline leg European legislators had originally in mind for so a finalized e-privacy regulation enter into effect together with the GDPR. As of today, however, the e-privacy reform process is still very much in progress and companies have been closely following the debates to understand how they will be required to adapt their current practices in order to comply with the forthcoming requirements. Today, we are going to discuss and examine the implication of the draft e-privacy regulation for digital marketing, and in particular, its impact on the advertising industry. We'll be looking at a range of issues, from behavioral advertisement to the use of cookies and similar technologies, consent and legitimate interest. We'll be also discussing the IAB Europe Transparency and Consent uh, Framework and how it aims to assist organizations. To help us with our understanding of these requirements and guide us through the legislation, we have the pleasure to have with us some fantastic speakers today. Firstly, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce Phil Lee, who is partner at Phil Fisher, with whom Data Guidance has worked for, with for a number of years. Phil is um, a partner in Phil Fisher Top Ranked Privacy Security and Information Group and holds a FIP, CIPPE, and CIPM status and is a member of the IAPP's privacy faculty. He specializes in supporting clients to develop and manage their transatlantic and wider data privacy compliance programs, having founded Phil Fisher's uh, Silicon Valley office in the US in 2012 an office which he then ran for four years. He has worked on multi-jurisdictional data privacy projects covering more than 80 territories worldwide and is particularly rec recognized for his expertise in international data transfer tra strategies, security incident response, and digital and offline marketing rules. Equally, it's my pleasure to introduce Noga Rosenthal, uh, who is Chief Privacy Officer at Epsilon. Uh, she brings extensive experience in online advertising, legal issues, and emerging technologies uh, to Epsilon. In her role as Chief Privacy Officer, Noga oversees all privacy-related activities for Epsilon and its conversant business, including global development, implementation, maintenance, and uh, ad adherence um, to the organization's policies and procedures covering the privacy of and access to online and offline consumer data. Responsibility include ensuring compliance with various self-regulatory regimes, as well as domestic, state, and federal laws and regulations and those of foreign jurisdictions. Lastly, but not least, we have Matthias Matisen, Director um, for Privacy and Public Policy at the Interactive Advertisement Bureau Europe, which represents the interest of the digital advertising industry in the European Union. Matthias represents the industry before the EU institutions, as well as vis-a-vis -vis EU data protection authorities on matters related to privacy and data protection. Next to his policy advocacy responsibilities, Matthias assists members with understanding and meeting privacy and data protection obligations, where he has been focusing on the creation of the industry transparency and concept framework, which enables the advertising industry to cooperate to meet requirements under EU data protection and privacy laws. So thank you um, all for joining us today and taking the time out of your day to be here with us. Before diving into the webinar, um, please note that we will leave time um, for a Q&A session at the end of the discussion. Uh, so please feel free to type in your question in the chat panel that you will find um, in the webinar panel. Um, today's discussion will include um, a first part um, relating to the scope and status of the e-privacy regulation, um, which will be um, addressed by Phil, impact of the e-privacy regulation on digital mar marketers, um, which will be addressed by Noga, and the IAB consent to and how this helps, um, which will be the topic um, addressed by Matthias. So I don't want to um, keep uh, but still time, more time to, the, to our speakers, and I will leave the words to Phil. 
That's great. Thank you very much for, for that introduction there. And good morning or good afternoon to you, um, depending on where you are joining us from. And um, my sincere thanks to Data Guidance for hosting today's webinar, which I'm delighted to be speaking on with such uh, distinguished panelists. So the, the e-privacy regulation, um, my job now is just to talk to you a little bit about what the e-privacy regulation aims to achieve and, and what its current status is and, and some of the legal impacts that that's going to have on the, the marketing industry. So perhaps if we can begin um, just by moving forward a slide here. Now, odds are you've just spent the past sort of 12 to 24 months of your life advising your clients or your business on uh, on how to get GDPR ready. And you were probably looking forward to uh, a bit of a break after, after May 25th, or at least if you weren't, then I know that I was. Um, well, I'm afraid the bad news is that that rest isn't going to come anytime soon because or while the GDPR has been an absolutely major dis development, um, you know, sort of impacting organizations and their handling of personal data all around the globe, we are going to go through a process of agreeing yet another European data protection law. This one with, you know, arguably even more significant impacts for those that have an online presence, which, you know, let's face it, these days is, is pretty much everybody. Now, if we move forward one side, so just to give you, before we get into sort of what the e-privacy regulation is designed to cover, let's just talk a little bit about its background and where it's come from. Now, the, the, the thing to know is the e-privacy regulation was first proposed by the European Commission in 2017. And when it was proposed, in the, uh, January 2017, I should say, and when it was proposed, the original idea was that it would come into effect uh, in May 2018, actually at the same time as the GDPR. The reason for that being that the e-privacy regulation is sort of sister legislation to the GDPR that deals with some very specific privacy risks in sort of over electronic communication channels. Now, um, anybody who knows European lawmaking will know that that was a highly ambitious timescale. And for ambitious there, you can sort of read uh, <laughs> unrealistic. Um, when you think about the, the GDPR itself, you, you know, that was a law that was, that was actually sort of proposed, um, you know, in 2012, it took through till 2018 to uh, actually sort of come into, into force. So that was a six year uh, time period from proposal through to, uh, through to agreement and coming into effect. And yet when it comes to the e-privacy regulation, which has some similarly very significant effects, um, you know, the, the, the Europe was aiming to achieve that in, in just little over a year. So in almost inevitably, um, that timeline wasn't met and the e-privacy regulation legislative um, development is still ongoing. Now, for those of you who are perhaps a little less familiar with um, European data protection law currently, I just want to make one point clear, which is that we already have an e-privacy law in force. And speaking as a private practice lawyer, one of the um, uh, one of the common topics I've seen over email over the past couple of months has been clients who have been writing to me um, talking about these e-privacy rules as though they are in an entirely new set of rules that, that are going to be created in Europe. And that's not the case. It really is just an evolution of existing e-privacy laws um, that we already have. Um, in fact, our current e-privacy directive was actually originally adopted back in 2002 and subsequently updated in 2009. Um, but there is a, an e-privacy directive in place which is going to be replaced by this new e-privacy regulation, much in the same way that the former data protection directive it was replaced by the general data protection regulation. We're gonna have this new e-privacy regulation. Now let's move forward. So you might reasonably be thinking to yourselves, well, why on earth, having just gone through all this, um, all this upheaval with the general data protection regulation, why on earth do we need yet another EU data protection law on top of that? Well, the first thing to know is that the e-privacy uh, e rules are designed to do something different from the general data protection rules we have in the EU. So when we talk about general data protection rules, we're thinking the general data protection regulation, which deals specifically with the processing 
of personal data. So any kind of data which is personal in nature, any collection, use, disclosure, sharing, whatever of that data is always going to be regulated by the General Data Protection Regulation. What our e-privacy laws uh, are designed to do is to address specific privacy risks that arise in the context of data passing over electronic communications channels. And what that means is that our e-privacy laws um, you know, fundamentally address, kind of, if you like, three key areas. They deal with the handling of electronic communications data. Now, what we mean by that is um, things like uh, you know, phone calls that are made, you know, whether that's landline or mobile calls, or uh, you know, even even potentially communications to and from, uh, you know, to and from sort of websites. Those those electronic communications, the content of those communications, and the metadata around those communications when they were sent, who, they, who sent them, who they were sent to, those things are protected under our e-privacy laws. E-privacy laws also address risks relating to the accessing or storing of information on devices. And when we talk about accessing or storing of information, we most commonly think about cookies, which are small files placed on the computer that can be used to kind of locally store some information that websites or the the, the service providers that support those websites can access and use to track people as they move around the web and do things like run analytics or serve targeted advertising. But one important thing to know is that our e-privacy laws never actually use the term cookies. They use the term information, so it has a broader effect. It's any accessing or storing of information on devices. Those are regulated by the e-privacy rules. And finally, um, the e-privacy rules also have specific um, rules governing marketing over electronic channels. So any kind of phone marketing, any kind of email or SMS marketing, uh, any kind of fax marketing, if anybody still does that, all of those things are also regulated by our e-privacy laws. And those things today are regulated under our e-privacy directive, but they're kind of getting a shot in the arm and they're gonna be replaced by this new e-privacy regulation, which evolves and strengthens some of those rules. So that's what the e-privacy um, rules are designed to cover. But why do we need updated rules? Well, there are a few reasons for this. And um, these are the kind of the, the next three bullets on this slide. But the, the, the thinking goes that the current e-privacy legislation that we have, our e-privacy directive, really just applies to communications that are sort of, you know, phone communications and communications through uh, through ISPs. It doesn't apply to parties that provide what we'd call functionally equivalent communication services. And what we're really thinking about there, for the most part, are parties that provide over-the-top communications. So we're thinking of the sort of Facebook messengers and the WhatsApps and the Skypes, the sort of the, the, the voice over IP type communication services. Um, the, the, the sort of view of the legislators is that those aren't sufficiently caught by the existing e-privacy directive. So the new e-privacy regulation aims to bring them sort of clearly within scope, along with sort of other types of communications, for example, communications between Internet of Things devices. So extending the scope of the rules was one goal. The next goal was to improve harmonization um, in two ways, really. One, harmonization with the general data protection regulation itself. The reason for that being that there are some areas that the GDPR deals with that are already covered under the e existing e-privacy directive. And so where you have the same issue being covered by two pieces of law, inevitably um, you, it kind of leads to duplication and some of that duplication invariably leads to some kind of conflict. And so if you look, for example, under the existing e-privacy directive, there are rules about data breach reporting for ISPs and telcos. But as you no doubt know, the GDPR has its own data breach reporting regime for anybody who handles personal data. And so there is a need to kind of align the two. And since breach reporting is now dealt with under the GDPR, that can be removed from the separate e-privacy legislation. Um, similarly, there are rules around processing of location data, which are sort of now clearly governed under the GDPR, which also can be removed explicitly from the e-privacy um, rules. So there's harmonization with the GDPR, making sure that the two things dovetail more regularly together. And then harmonization throughout the EU as well. And the, re and the, the thinking here is that um, you may remember that our, our previous general data protection uh, legislation, the Data Protection Directive, was a directive, which essentially means that it's a law passed at a European Union level, but it doesn't automatically take effect in every member state. Each member state had to pass its own national law.
And so one of the goals in the GDPR was instead to, to pass data protection rules as a regulation, which means a law which again is passed at an EU level, but doesn't require national implementation. Once the laws are passed, they apply in theory uniformly throughout all member states. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the theory. Now, our e-privacy rules are also currently a directive, which means you get all of these local member state implementation. And when you get member states implementing a law, they invariably do so in slightly different ways. So you get variances and differences of approach that creep in, which creates for a very disharmonized approach throughout the EU, particularly when you look at things like e-marketing rules or handling of cookie consents. And so the goal with the e-privacy regulation, again, is to pass these e-privacy rules as a regulation. So you get the same rules that apply throughout the EU in a uniform basis. Again, whether that happens in practice, we'll have to wait and see, but that's the theory. And then the final sort of um, the final sort of goal of the privacy regulation, if you like, is to, you know, on the one hand, allow for more business innovation, while at the same time strengthening enforcement of um, of privacy breaches in the in the privacy sphere. So uh, on the business innovation front, you will see that the e privacy regulation provides for slightly wider use of communications data and particularly metadata and slightly um, broader exemptions from cookie consent requirements than is the case under the current e-privacy directive, while at the same time keeping those rules very strict. And it also makes clear that, that breaches of the e-privacy regulation can be enforced in exactly the same way as breaches of the General Data Protection Regulation, meaning that you once again have exposure to these you know, enormous fines of up to 4% of annual worldwide turnover. Next slide, please. Now, I mentioned that one of the goals of the e-privacy regulation is to kind of, you know, more clearly lay out the rules for handling of electronic communications data. Now, because the focus of this presentation is primarily on the marketing impacts of the e-privacy regulation, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this slide. Um, what this slide does basically is just briefly to summarize um, the, the rules for uses of electronic communications data under the e-privacy directive. What is electronic communications data? It is essentially communication sent over electronic channels. So again, those, those phone calls, those email messages, those, uh, those WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger messages. And what the e-privacy regulation says is that it, it uses three defined terms. It talks about electronic communications data, which refers to content and metadata collectively. It's the whole lot. And it also talks specifically about content and separately about metadata. And what this slide does is to show you in the middle of this kind of um, uh, sort of oval here, um, what permitted uses of all electronic communications data are. So it allow you can process electronic communications data to transmit a communication, obviously, and also for sort of maintaining and restoring security and defect, detecting faults and errors in the communication. Believe it or not, those are new things that weren't explicitly catered for in the existing e-privacy directive. And then it also has some specific allowance for use of metadata, for example, for um, for billing and interconnection and fulfillment of quality of service requirements and monitoring metadata for the purposes of preventing fraud and abuse. And similarly, some spe um, specified uses of content. And when you, particularly when you look at the content side of things, you'll look that you know essentially any access to um, content of communications is pretty much gated by a requirement for consent. And sometimes those consent requirements are um, one-sided consents where the user who's receiving the communication or sending the communication can give consent if it's processing of that content just to provide them with a service. A simple example might be, let's say, Gmail filtering your inbox to sort out which are promotional emails and which are social networking updates and things like that. And some forms of uh, uses are two-sided consents, meaning you need consent from both parties to the communication. But anyway, you'll see when you look at this, actually, although this is intended to be a summary of what the rules are, they're relatively complicated. And I should say as well, this is just the initial proposal from the European Commission. Um, these, these proposals are being developed by the Parliament and the Council as the debate goes on. Now, let's move on to the next slide. Now this is this is where it becomes a little bit more interesting for those in the in the marketing space. Um, the 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 e-privacy regulation has some new rules on tracking, or I should say more accurately say updated rules on tracking. So we're, we're sort of moving into cookie law 2.0. Now what the e-privacy regulation says is that if you are accessing or storing information on the device, so that might be 
um, that might be storing cookies, it might be dropping pixels, it might be creating digital fingerprints, it might be accessing unique device identifiers, any of those things, then generally you still need consent for that. So exactly in the same way that you have a consent requirement under the current law, you're gonna have that under the e-privacy regulation. What it does though, is to potentially provide for some wider exemptions from the consent requirement. And one that's particularly caught a lot of people's eye is, the, is a potential exemption for analytics. Now, there's a lot of debate still ongoing about what that analytics exemption would look like, whether it is only analytics if the actual analytics is conducted by the website that's pro um, providing uh, the actual service, or whether it would extend to analytics conducted by a third party, for example, those websites or apps that, in that integrate Google Analytics. Um, but it looks, one way or another, it looks like there is a general consensus that analytics in some shape or form is going to be exempted from the consent requirement. Similarly, there seems to be a general consensus that there's going to be exemption for um, automatic sort of downloads of security updates where you need to install new security software on a device um, to in install the latest patch or whatever to, to guard the device against, um, you know, security um, breaches. So those seem to be sort of some new exemptions that are coming through. We'll look again at those a bit later in another slide. And then there is going to be, an, this, there, the, the really big change under the new law is that there is an onus placed on um, sort of browser manuf website browser manufacturers and on mobile operating system providers to actually get consent for tracking upfront when the browser or the OS is first installed or turned on. Um, and you know, this seems to get a kind of upfront consent or any kind of future tracking that might take place on the device. Now, again, we'll revisit that on the later slide. So I'll just kind of raise the issue here and we'll come back to it. Uh, also on tracking, the e-privacy regulation introduces some new rules around Wi-Fi tracking. Now, for those of you who are, you know, sort of less um, technologically aware, you may not know, but that um, your, your mobile phone uh, and some other devices routinely broadcast data about themselves. Uh, you know, and the reason they do that is to look for, um, for, for connection points that they can connect to in order to get a Wi-Fi signal. So your iPhone, your Android device is broadcasting a signal every now and again, basically saying, hey world, here I am. Are there any Wi-Fi points in the area? And if, and if a Wi-Fi point responds and said, yes, there's a Wi-Fi point here, the two can connect and you get a Wi-Fi connection. Now, what, um, what some marketers have worked out is that actually, if you kind of look at those signals that are being broadcast, you can, uh, they typically contain information that's unique to the, the, to the device that's broadcasting them. And then you can use that information either for analytics purposes, working, for example, out how many um, unique uh, people walk into a store because you count the number of unique devices that are coming into a store or it can be used for sort of targeting um, related purposes. And so the e-privacy regulation proposes some regulation around that. And it basically says that, you know, obviously broadcasting, you know, a connect, collecting this data for the purposes of connecting to a device, you know, enabling a Wi-Fi connection is, is generally gonna be okay. Um, there is an ongoing debate around whether, uh, whether it, it or, whether general collection of that data for sort of other purposes like footfall counting, by which I mean analytics counting, ought to be permitted provided there's sufficient transparency and security of the data. And there's not a kind of a uniform consensus on that. Now, there was an original proposal that this should kind of be allowed by default subject to kind of transparency and opt-out. There are some quarters that are pushing for it to be done more on an opt-in basis. That still has to work through the process. Next slide, please. And then we have some new rules for sort of email marketers. Um, so, or, or I say new rules, it, it, the perception is that they're new rules, but actually the interesting thing here, here is that the rules around email marketing under the e-privacy regulation are generally untouched from the current status um, uh, under the current EU uh, e-privacy EU e directive. Now that generally comes to, as a surprise to a lot of particularly UK based marketers um, because you know a lot of people say well you know the e-privacy regulation is introducing a new consent requirement for b2b marketing actually that isn't strictly speaking correct the consent requirement or the soft opt-in consent requirement already exists under the EU e-privacy directive the reason it tends to throw a lot of UK marketers is that actually in the UK, we didn't implement the e-privacy rules correctly on this point. So currently in the UK, 
uh, email marketing is only really regulated under our e-privacy rules, the PEC regulations, for B2C marketing, but not for B2B marketing. So in the UK, B2B marketing is generally permitted on an opt-out basis currently. Under the EU e-privacy directive, however, they were, uh, since 2009 at least, they've been regulated in exactly, B2B marketing has been regulated in exactly the same way as B2C marketing, meaning that you either need opt-in or you need to show that a soft opt-in exemption applies. Now, um, again, we'll come back to that, but it does mean that, um, you know, while it's not a change at an EU level, if where you have got countries like the UK that have adopted a more relaxed position on B2B marketing, those countries will be brought into line with the e-privacy regulation when it's adopted to kind of raise the standard from being opt-out in those countries through to opt-in or soft opt-in. So there will be a change, but it's actually technically not a legal change at an EU-wide level. It's only a change in those member states that didn't implement the existing rules correctly. And then beyond that, there are some rules around sort of um, uh, phone operators um, and the requirement to provide um, caller ID or allow people to block caller IDs or to block calls from sort of um, from, from specific IDs when they don't want to receive them. And there are also rules around including people's contact details in publicly available directories. And the short version of that is that if it's if it's contact details about a natural person, you need their consent. If it's a legal person, then generally that can happen on the basis of opt-out. Next slide, please. So just returning to this point around cookies, um, you know, having having said that, you know, the, the, the basic principles are saying that you're still need, going to need consent for cookies. What is changing under the e-privacy regulation? Well, here on this slide, I've just done a sort of slightly a slightly more detailed side-by-side -side analysis. So if you look under the current e-privacy directive, you need consent to access or store information like cookies. Well, that basically stays the same under the e-privacy regulation, so no change there. Under the current e-privacy regulation, there are exemptions from this consent requirement for cookies that are strictly necessary to provide a service explicitly requested by the user. Uh, so that might be uh, cookies which are necessary to provide um, functionality on the website the user has requested, which would be things like, for example, shopping basket functionality on a website or enabling secure login functionality on a website. Those things would qualify as strictly necessary cookies and not require consent. There are also exemptions for accessing or storing information where the sole purpose is for transmission to that device. Simple example there would be collecting an IP address from the device if that IP address is being used only to transmit the web page to the device obviously you don't ask for consent in that context. The difference under the e-privacy regulation is that those exemptions exist, but they're potentially broadened to include exemptions for analytics and security updates, which we discussed earlier. Also under discussion are potential exemptions for our employer IT management. So if you think about this, what we're talking about are uh, sort of employee, employers who issue devices to their employees and install software on that to you know, stop the employees absconding with the device or to monitor the performance of that device. Potentially, there's some discussion about whether that should be exempted from consent requirements. And equally, um, the use of, uh, uh, the use of uh, sort of cookies and similar technologies for fraud prevention purposes. So uh, you know, ensuring security of payment transactions and the like may also be exempt from the consent requirement. Again, seems like a relatively sort of um, uh, a, a relatively common sense exemption if it comes through. Uh, now, under the e-privacy directive, uh, the, 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 the general position today is that um, the, this consent for cookies is, is often dealt with on an implied consent basis. And uh, implied consent is, is accepted or tolerated in most member states. However, uh, you know, the e-privacy regulation makes abundantly clear that the consent for, for sort of cookies and similar technologies must actually now be achieved to a GDPR standard. And actually, since the GDPR has come into effect, that's probably the case anyway, now uh, under the existing rules. And what that means is that your consent for cookies or similar technologies must now be unambiguous and require an affirmative action. So generally, you're looking more towards an opt-in for cookies than simply, uh, or at least a very clear action on the part of the user having been given notice of what action will qualify as consent um, in order to indicate their consent. And then finally, under the e-privacy directive, um, the, the responsibility for getting consent under the current law is basically left either to the website publisher or the app publisher or to the service provider that's actually dropping the cookies or trackers. It's basically whichever party is serving the cookies is meant to get consent 
Under the e-privacy regulation, though, the, there is this new requirement that, um, that browser providers or mobile operating system providers or anybody else who provides sort of software that enables connection to the internet has to offer tracking consent options upon initial installation. And so it's not, the, the, the whole onus is not being pushed just to the, to the, sort of the websites or the apps, but it's actually being, it's being pushed more to the software that enables access to that information. And the goal really there is to try and do away with all these consent banners that you see on websites and that sometimes you see within apps and actually push the responsibility more to an initial one-time upfront kind of consent when somebody first installs their software. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. But there are a series of un unanswered questions, which is why this is going to be a, a difficult legislative passage. Um, you know, the, the, the big question is how do browsers or operating systems get a GDPR standard consent up front? Remembering that consent has to be freely given, specific and informed, and that the guidance we've had from the regulators is that, you know, when you're relying on consent, that consent needs to identify by name the parties who are going to be relying on that consent. Well, if as a, if as a browser manufacturer, how do you know which third parties are going to be dropping cookies. You can't possibly name them up front. And so it seems almost like Europe has kind of boxed itself into a slightly regulatory corner here by on the one hand requiring a very exacting standard of consent, but then pushing that kind of consent requirement to browser manufacturers or operating systems, but set at a level that they can't really legally achieve. So there has to be some discussion about how that would work in practice. Equally, there's a question about how you ensure consistency across browsers and operating systems. Now, what we mean there is that if you think about it from the position of a website um, or a, an app, um, you know, if you are looking to see whether or not somebody has consented to your cookies or tracking technologies, you need to communicate with the browser to say, you know, hey, has this person consented? And that browser needs to respond to you. Now, what you need there is an agreed protocol for that communication. You know, if somebody is using, if one user is using Chrome, you don't want Chrome speaking you, to you in one language and then somebody else using Firefox and that and Firefox speaking to you in a different language. You somehow need to get a consistent implementation of what consent looks like across all of the browsers and across all of the operating systems so that the websites and the apps know how to respond to those consent signals. Uh, similarly, there's a question around who's responsible for consent failures. So let's take a question, say, um, say a browser um, fails to get consent um, for a tracking cookie. Um, not that it, not that somebody doesn't give consent, just that the browser doesn't ask. What happens then when that user visits a website, or, you know, it, and the website sees that there hasn't been a refusal of consent, so drops a cookie? Who is liable in that case for dropping a cookie when the user hasn't clearly given a consent? Was it the browser's fault for drop uh, for, for failing to ask? Was it the website's fault for, um, you know? Uh, not interpreting the, the no the, the the absence of a single signal as a no consent or as responsibility somehow shared between them that has to be worked out there's a very big question around also around whether this can all be done in time you know the the um the the, the there's a debate ongoing about when these rules will come into force once they're passed um you know will they come into force immediately upon passage of the legislation will there be some small uh some small legislative implementation window uh, you know, the early proposal from the Commission, for example, was that um, if if the law passed in May, then there'll be a small window for browsers to implement this new the, the new consent requirements up to August. But that's a very short period of time for big technological changes to be made. And if you think that um, you know what we're trying to legislate for here is almost like a do not track standard, and you know the World Wide Web Consortium has been trying to achieve that for six or seven years and not succeeded, there's a there's a very big question mark about whether this could be done promptly enough. And then there are the, the, the slightly more um, existential questions around what happens to, uh, sorry, they should say ad funded content. What happens to websites and apps that rely on ad funded content, uh, content for their revenues if we move to more of an opt in world, a strict opt in world for cookies and tracking based advertising? Um, you know, how do those websites and apps continue to get revenue? Particularly bearing in mind that some of the really big players will, will be in a position to, uh, you know, quote unquote, force consent, or, you know, will just have such a well-developed relationship with their users that their users will happily give consent, as opposed to some of the, you know, the small smart startup players who, um, you know, who users won't happily hand over um, subscription revenues to. And so they rely on ad funding content to get, start to get started. What does all this mean? We don't have the answers to those yet. Noga will speak a bit more to some of them, but these are the big unanswered questions that we have right now. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
And then just uh, just very briefly, why all the fuss about marketing then? Well, we've said that you know currently uh, at an EU level, the, the rules, whether it's B2C or B2B marketing, are that you either have to get opt-in consent or you have to show that a soft opt-in applies, which means that you collect somebody's details in the course of a sale and in doing so, you give them the ability to opt out and they don't exercise that right of opt out and you're marketing your own products and services anyway. If all those conditions are met, then you can, whether it's B2B or B2C, conduct marketing on an opt out basis. Uh, however, you know, some member states haven't implemented those opt, -in, those opt in or soft opt in rules currently, the UK being the big example, where B2B marketing under the e-privacy regulation, uh, sorry, e e privacy and electronic communications regulations, the PEC regs in the UK, they currently allow B2B marketing on, on, on a sort of unregulated basis, which means that people just go ahead and, and do it on opt-out regardless. Now, um, the e-privacy regulation, if it comes into force, that won't change the EU level rules, but it will mean that those member states that currently have a lower standard will have to be brought into line with the, the general opt-in or soft opt-in requirements throughout the EU. So that potentially means that, um, that the e-marketing rules will get slightly stricter in some countries. And in addition, um, you, for those countries where soft, for the soft opt-in requirement, again, some countries have a very um, relaxed interpretation of that currently. Again, you know, countries like the UK or Ireland will typically allow soft opt-in to apply uh, even if there hasn't been an actual transaction concluded. They kind of interpret those words in the context of a sale quite broadly um, to include sort of uh, initial expressions of interest in a product as qualifying for uh, as data collected in the context of a sale. Whereas other countries like the Netherlands actually require a, an, a transaction to take place for um, soft opt-in to apply. So it may, and, and if bearing in mind, again, we're gonna have one set of rules throughout the EU, or we've got this new consistency mechanism under the GDPR, it may mean that the general interpretation of soft opt-in requirements become stricter throughout the EU as well. Finally, um, the, the one potential big impact is on phone marketing. Now, currently under the e-privacy directive, the, the e-privacy directive allows member states to choose um, whether to allow phone marketing on an opt-in or an opt-out basis. And the majority of member states allow phone marketing on an opt-out basis, subject to screening call lists against national do not call registries. The e-privacy regulation does have a change here, and it generally sets the standard that phone marketing should be done on an opt-in basis going forward unless member states choose to derogate from that. So unlike the current position where member states kind of have a free choice, the baseline under the privacy regulation is that it will be opt-in unless member states choose to implement opt-out. So it's a very subtle shift, but it may mean that there becomes more of a movement towards opt-in for phone marketing going forward as well. So that's me wrapped up. Sorry, I'm running a little bit behind schedule. So perhaps at this point, we can just move forward a slide. Oh, just very briefly, when will all this happen? Regulation was proposed in 2017. The debate is still going on. The European Parliament um, adopted its position on the new law in, in, Oct in October 2017. But the European Council, which is our sort of, if you like, our upper legislative chamber, is still debating its position on the regulation. Once it has an agreed position, it has to get together with the European Parliament. They have to, in this thing called the trilogue, where they have a, a, a sort of an argy-bargy between them, a negotiation between them, brokered by the European Commission to try and get an approved position, a, a, an agreed position between them on what the e-privacy regulation should look like. And then the law has to be adopted. And just working through the timescales for doing that, it's unlikely to happen before Q1 or Q2 in 2018. That's my, my prediction. Move forward a slide, please. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Noga, who is going to talk about the, the industry impact of the e-privacy regulation. Thanks, Phil. And I'm going to concentrate on two of the issues that you brought up, um, which is consent in the digital, digi sorry, digital advertising world, as well as the browser role. Um, so going to the next slide, when you look at industry, um, you see the complexity of what, how industry works today, which is that when I go to a website as a consumer, um, if I've been, for instance, uh, bucketed into a runner uh, segment, the website um, will then put that up for auction, put my that, that segment, the runner segment, up for auction. And two sneaker companies can then bid to serve me with an ad. And that ad decision is made within seconds of my appearing on that website. And the question is, how do you get consent 
um, for instance, if, if Adidas ends up winning that ad um, and they use their own cookie or their agency cookie, how do you quickly get consent for that cookie when you don't even know to that last millisecond that um, on the demand side, that's what the DM, uh, DSP side, the demand side, is quickly making that decision that, that, that I'll get that Adidas ad. Um, going to the next page, um, same, same with the, um, sorry, this, this is the buy side and that was the sell side. Um, so how do you, um, again, how do you do this from the browser side and the, the uh, sorry, the advertiser side and the publisher side? The, the industry is so complex um, that, that the reality is can we really get consent for all the cookies that are being used? Um, so going to the next slide. So again, what, what Phil stated before was that under um, the e-privacy directive that is currently in, in force, um, the definition of consent now points to GDPR, where we need unambiguous and an, un, and an affirmative action to drop the cookie on the user's browser. And what we've seen so far, even without the e-privacy regulation, um, reinforcing that viewpoint that you need consent for cookies is that um, some, some sites have gone ahead and blocked European users. Um, others, including the ICO, which is the example in the middle, um, actually drop a cookie um, and then say to the consumer that um, we're dropping a cookie and you can opt out, which is basically the cookie banner or the opt out model that was uh, the implied consent model that's in place um, prior to GDPR. Um, and then we're also seeing things like, um, I believe this is the, um, the Washington Post that has a premium EU subscription where they offer a different, a, a different pricing model to consumers where um, they may charge the consumer to have access to the, to the website. Um, they, they still will get advertising, it's just there won't be any, um, um, sorry, there's no on-site advertising and there's no third-party tracking. Um, the middle um, option is to have that um, interest-based advertising, uh, but there's still that service fee. So one of the things, um, as we've looked through this, as we've seen industry respond to, again, just to the e-privacy directive today is, again, this mass confusion around what we have to do. What, what, is, what is the consent, the affirmative action need to be? What, what are we seeing? Um, so for today, for instance, I saw a tiny little banner on a website um, after it was pointed out to me that that was the website trying to get consent um, or implied uh, consent. Um, and frankly, I, I missed that banner. Um, so, so to me, that wasn't enough. Um, that wasn't, it wasn't, there was ambiguity that I really see the banner when I, when the cookie was dropped on my browser. Um, there, there needs to be some action. So what's that action? Um, and it seems most companies are moving towards taking, um, browsing on the site or, or taking some action on the site that indicates, for instance, closing the, the cookie consent box. Um, to show that they've consented. So for instance, if we go to the next slide, you'll see what, um, again, I'm, I represent Epsilon and Conversant. Um, if you go to our EMEA site, you'll see that we have a little cookie banner pop up. Um, it's more than a banner, it's a consent widget that pops up that explains to the consumer, it's very, you know, we're providing transparency um, to the consumer saying, here, we're dropping a cookie on you. For instance, we may drop a, a Google Analytics cookie on your browser as you go through the Conversant website. Um, you have the ability to opt out. Um, and you could either, again, X the box or continue to the site to continue seeing what's on the site. So one of the big questions, again, is um, come the e-privacy reg, what we're hearing is that um, sites may not actually be able to block consumers from accessing their site or offer them a variation of their site um, should they not consent. So 81% of EU publishers rely on advertising revenue, the news publishers, um, while 60% of mobile apps rely on advertising revenue. So can they put up this, this um, pop-up that says, um, you cannot access my site if you don't allow for advertising, um, including interest-based advertising, which is three times more valuable than regular advertising. Um, can you 
Um, and it seems there's indications that from the regulators that, that websites cannot do this. So they would have to allow the consumer to access the site whether or not they agree to the advertising or not. So then the question becomes, well, um, you know, if, if can I put up a paywall in general, then um, can I, you know, can I pick, can I say to a user, um, either you let me do advertising or you let me, or I charge you a subscription fee. Um, and we actually, we had worked on this years ago with, with websites here in the U.S. even where we had a music streaming site that allowed users that option either to pay for the music or um, through a paywall or to continue using um, the free site through advertising. And the paywall failed. Um, we've heard from other music streaming sites that they have half of their users doing um, the, the subscription and half doing um, the advertising and getting the free access. Um, the reality is, is that most sites probably need both, both advertising and payment to keep up the free content that, that users are used to today. Um, and so there, um, again, um, what we heard from, from the, the parliament last year was that their, their answer to this question of, if I can't block users, what do I do, um, was to put up a paywall and to um, have everybody go to the subscription model. And the reality is with that um, is that they would, users, consumers, us, me, you, would have to choose what sites, what newspaper articles, uh, newspaper sites we'd want to register with and, and pay for. So all the diversity of what we're used to reading today, getting all the different viewpoints um, from, from various newspapers, the conservative view or the more liberal view, um, the music we listen to, whether we listen to um, guitar solo or pop music, um, you'd have to make a decision as to which, which sites you would support through um, this paywall. Um, again, there's also the complexity of the ecosystem. Um, can we really get um, consent um, and talk via the browser? So for me, um, one of the big implications of this is that I, I personally wouldn't want the browser having this, the discussion with consumers. Um, I would want to control that discussion or I would want my website to control that discussion with consumers to let them know um, if you want to access the site, it's, it's um, supported through advertising and therefore we, and we use cookies for, for um, keeping track of what um, ads have been served, for instance. Um, so there'd be more of a dialogue of what the trade-off is, whereas on the browser side, we just don't know what the discussion would be with users. Um, the other thing we're seeing, um, if you don't mind just going to the next slide, um, I think the other problem we're going to see is that, um, that, that, again, if it goes to the browser level, we're still hearing that websites can still have that pop-up consent um, widget that says, do you consent to cookies? So we go back to square one where those pop-ups are appearing anyway. Um, and so again, we're not really solving the, the problem that, that the websites were trying to solve. The, I'm sorry, the regulators were trying to solve for. Um, some of the other things we're seeing is that, um, at least today, again, is, is just the mass confusion. Um, I think that's that's been the biggest struggle for us as a company um, has just been that com some websites are still relying on on cookie banners um, where they're you know, it's not very visible at times. Um, others are getting the, um, doing the affirmative consent, unambiguous affirmative consent that we're, we're promoting, um, including the Keneal, by the way. They also have that on their website. Um, and so there, there's been a lot of confusion on that side. Um, the other thing, too, is just making sure that we all are able to talk to each other within the ecosystem. So as you saw the complexity there, um, and as Phil pointed out, how will the browsers let us know if they've gotten consent um, or not? What happens if, if somebody gives, um, does not give consent via the browser, but this does give it at the browser, at the website level? Which of those consents can control? And we have that issue today as well. Um, if I consent to, um, on one website to a conversion cookie, but not another, what happens? What, which consent or which opt-out controls? The other question, too, is, um, you know, do we need to remind consumers that they have opted in um, on a, every six months, which is, again, something that we've been hearing. Um, does the opt-in consent, 
expire at some point? Um, so these are all questions of, you know, if we're reminding consumers or if we have to reconsent every 13 months, then again, we're, we're going towards that um, pop-up consent widget coming up more often, which again will lead to consent fatigue. The other thing too that we've seen from some um, from some uh, uh, privacy think tanks is that there is a little bit of a worry that the e-privacy regulation is relying on consent too much, um, which which could undermine some aspects of the GDPR, which included um, the right to rely on legitimate interests of a business to do certain processes. Um, so that's another area of contention for for the industry. Um, and then. Again, I, my last point, I know we're running out of time, is the take it or leave it uh, tracking walls um, not being allowed. So we'll see. We'll see what, what's going to happen in industry. But, but again, I, I encourage you to look at the consent widgets that are up today and, and um, implementing them. That, that's my personal viewpoint. Um, so, Matias, turning it to you, um, again, from, from the ad tech side, you know, our big thing is making sure that we all are able to talk to each other, that we don't have this fragmented discussion and that we all use the same language around what interest-based advertising means, for instance. Um, can you speak, please, to how the IEB has come in and played um, in this framework? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've started looking at these requirements uh, for GDPR, consent, transparency, you know, one and a half years ago or so. and. Uh, as Will has, uh, um, as Phil has explained, um, if you essentially if you solve GDPR consent, you can solve e-privacy consent at the same time. So this is a transparency and consent framework that helps companies meet uh, these requirements, uh, you know, for for both GDPR and e-privacy purposes. And uh, we we looked at these uh, requirements uh, particularly from from the transparency point of view. Um, again, something Phil has mentioned, you need to disclose by name those um, controllers who will be relying on the consent, which is pretty difficult um, when you don't necessarily know ahead of time um, who is going to be processing data because there is a, a real-time auction going on. Um, and um, also, there's a lot of different types of processing activities that are going on, and um, having countless, or not countless, but you know, dozens of uh, vendors and controllers try and explain and obtain consent for all of these various processing activities in a non-standardized way uh, can be a challenge. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that there is a central and standardized place uh, that enables publishers and, and app developers to make disclosures of the vendors who are processing data, as well as um, storing or accessing information using cookies or whatever, um, um, and, and, and the purposes um, of that processing as well. So we have actually gone and looked at our industry and tried to come up with standard definitions of purposes which could be disclosed uh, to users that, that you know at least the vast majority of vendors in this ecosystem um, could could work with and uh, that, that that then enables us to, to provide better transparency than we were uh, able to do in the past um, secondly um, the accountability principle of the GDPR means that you need to be able to demonstrate that consent has been given uh, when you rely on it in today's world, a ad tech company usually assumes that when it has the opportunity to process data um, or the opportunity to read a cookie or to set a cookie, the publisher has obtained uh, the appropriate consent for that. Um, assuming, however, makes it pretty difficult to positively demonstrate um, that consent had really been um, given. So we've also looked at creating a positive signal that allows vendors to know based on a representation of the publisher that they have indeed obtained consent in that standardized way. And that signal uh, says not just yes, consent has been obtained, but indeed says consent has been obtained for company X or company Y and not company Z. And it also says consent has been obtained for purpose one purpose two, but not purpose three, and so on. So there is um, quite, quite a bit of granularity in what this framework uh, can, can, can achieve. Um, it will essentially, because publishers are responsible for making the disclosures and to ask and obtain that consent, that puts a lot of control into the publisher's hands because they 
by choosing who to disclose and who to obtain consent for or establish another legal basis for, uh, they control essentially who the vendors are that get to process their users' data. And because we are making available a granular signal, publishers can use the possibility of generating the signal to create user choice. Who can select which vendor they would like to allow to process their personal data or to store uh, cookies and, and other identifiers on their devices and for which purposes. And in doing this in a standardized way, this is to what you were saying, Oga, um, we, we are hopefully reducing the costs of um, providing transparency um, and obtaining uh, consent under the GDPR in a complex ecosystem where it is frankly unthinkable that um, you know, millions of websites and thousands of vendors would implement bespoke mechanisms uh, for each of those relationships. So instead, we have a single open source and industry um, uh, governed standard uh, that achieves that. And um, it doesn't try and provide a single tool. It provides just the backbone for vendors and, 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 and companies and publishers to develop their own, um, their own tools implementing this standard. So we are not really competing. We're just giving the tools for existing tools and new tools to come up and make them better and work for the industry. Thank you very much, um, Matthias, um, and thank you, thank you very much, Noga and Phil, for your uh, very insightful presentations. Um, we will have now um, a bit of time for um, a Q and A um, session. Um, so we have had a, quite a few um, uh, questions from the from the um, audience, and of course, we won't have time to go through all of them. But I believe that the speakers have also replied to many of those in their presentations. So. Um, we will just address um, three. Um, so, uh, question, um, uh, when do the e-privacy rules apply? Is it the same territorial test as the directive slash DTPR? This is the first question. Thanks, so thanks I very much. So, I believe that Phil, yeah. That, that is, I'll, I'll take that one. And actually, just before I do, I'll also just mention that uh, a few people while watching the presentation pointed out the deliberate error in my my slides, um, which I put in there just to see if you were all awake, which is the, which is the timing for the e-privacy regulation. I said Q1, Q2, uh, 2018. I did, of course, mean 2019. So just to point that out. Um, as for when the, uh, when the e-privacy regulation applies, it is a different test to that under the Data Protection Directive or indeed the new GDPR, although there are some similarities. It essentially is uh, it will apply to anybody who is providing uh, communication services to European users or who is accessing or storing information on European users' devices. Again, um, remember with all of this that it is draft legislation, so this is all subject to change, but that's the current thinking. Perfect. Uh, thank Can I ask you very a quick much. Question. If you are a, a EU, an EU company and a US person um, uh, with a device for access, would you still be in scope of those rules? Uh, that's a good question. I need to remind me to go back to the legislation just to double check that. I think you can safely assume that anybody who is in the EU will always be uh, subject to to the to sort of the EU rules. Um, so. Uh, so, yes, my, my gut instinct would be yes, but I would need to double check that, Matthias. Perfect. Uh, so, the, the next question, um, which is for Phil, um, it's regarding B2B marketing. Is it not the case that e-privacy regulation leaves it to member states whether to cover B2B marketing the same as the current law? Uh, no, that's, that's not quite right, although I can understand um, the thinking behind it. So. The the e privacy regulation makes it clear that when it comes to email marketing, it, it is going to be opt in or soft opt in that applies for for B two C or B two B marketing. There is, however, um, a provision within the e privacy regulation that basically says um, that there is some flexibility left to member states to protect the the legitimate interests of end users that are legal persons. But what it's it, it, what it's meaning there, it's allowing flexibility for member states to extend 
e-privacy rules to marketing communications sent to legal entities as opposed to named users at those legal entities. So in other words, currently if you are marketing to let's say an info at fieldfisher.com address, that's not covered by um, the existing law and it's not going to be covered by uh, the e-privacy regulation directly, but the e-privacy regulation is basically saying that member states can, if they want, extend some of those rules to include that marketing to specific corporate mailing addresses. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, another question that we have from the audience is, um, with respect to the current e-privacy directive and GDPR, shouldn't the consent requirement now be that under GDPR, um, since it is already effective, is it correct that we cannot rely on implied consent anymore? That's a very good question, and you're broadly correct that um, at the moment, you, you know, the e-privacy directive says you've got to get consent for cookies. With the GDPR coming into force, that consent now has to be a GDPR standard consent. Um, the GDPR requires that that consent has to be uh, has to be unambiguous. Now, technically, it is possible to have an unambiguous implied consent. In other words, where it is sufficiently clear from a user's behavior that they meant to give consent in such that the, the behavior is unambiguous, you can still imply consent. So you will still find as you go around websites in the EU, there are still some of these mechanisms that display a prominent notice on the screen and say, by continuing to use this website, um, you, you know, you agree to our use of cookies. In theory, um, that, consent, that kind of use of implied consent is still possible, albeit that it's certainly not going to be the regulatory preference. And really what changes under the e-privacy regulation is to make it abundantly clear that consents under the e-privacy regulation must be GDPR standard consents. At the moment, what we're kind of doing is having a fairly convoluted interpretation, say the e-privacy directive requires consent, consent is defined by the directive, but the directive has been replaced by the GDPR, therefore it should be a GDPR consent. The e-privacy regulation kind of fixes all of that and just says, when it's consent, we mean GDPR consent. Brilliant. But if I um, jump in here, uh, there is um, an interesting development sort of in the political sphere. There has been a meeting of uh, telecommunications um, ministers last Friday, and in the run-up to that meeting, um, which also discussed the e-privacy regulation, the responsible European commissioners have sent a letter to those ministers saying um, that uh, GDPR consent will be required in their view, under the existing e-privacy directive, and because the commission is a little bit cranky that ministers haven't been able to agree the new e-privacy regulation, the commission has essentially threatened that any wrong implementation of, um, of the existing e-privacy rules would be subject to European Commission scrutiny. Um, so even, you know, e even though the obligations are on the e-privacy directive um, accrues to member states implementing the law appropriately, the European Commission can take infringement proceedings against any countries who do not do so appropriately, and that's what they have um, said they will be doing. Okay. Um, one last question from the audience that we are able to take. Um, so, does the draft e privacy regulation include targeted advertising in the restrictions on electronic marketing? Uh, it's, this is a very good question. So obviously there are these restrictions around the collection and also the access to or storage of information under the e-privacy regulation, which is, you know, essentially how targeted advertising works. But there has been a separate debate around whether the rules on um, direct marketing, so that, you know, the kind of e-marketing rules we were talking about requiring consent or soft opt-in whether they should be extended to include targeted advertising explicitly as well. And when you look at the, the current wording of the, or, or, or the draft of the e-privacy regulation, they talk about you know, consent being required for the sending of direct marketing. And um, there has been some debate about whether those words should be changed to the sending or presenting of direct marketing. And the thinking goes that using the words, present, uh, using the words or presenting direct marketing would include um, you know, display advertising online or in apps, so the targeted advertising. And so aside from the cookie requirements, would introduce an explicit consent requirement for sort of online targeted advertising. The, the, I mean, that's still being debated, 
certainly the regulatory community is in favour of it. Um, the, the, you know, the council is resisting that as a position currently. But of course, you know, everything's to play for until the final version of the law is agreed. Fantastic. Um, so thank you very much, um, especially to our wonderful speakers, uh, so Phil Lee, um, uh, Noga Rosenthal, and um, uh, Ma uh, Matthias Ma Matison, um, who have been uh, brilliant in outlining um, the e-privacy um, challenges that we will face and what's on the table. Um, so thank you very much for listening into the webinar, um, and I hope you we will be asked with us um, again. Um, thank you very much to Phil Fisher for hosting the webinar with us as well. Very much my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.